Good morning, Irvine. Good morning. Smaller crowd today, early, foggy day, midterm is out of the way. Okay, but the enthusiasm continues. <laughs> At least on my part. Okay, and all of those enjoying your physics, let's do a little more uh, today with uh, physics and society. I want to do some more on that for you. Um, there was, I believe somebody said something I should say to the class as a whole. Uh, one thing that's coming to mind is the content for the final exam. I will write all of the questions on the final exam related to the material presented after the midterm. So in that sense, the physics is not cumulative with the thermodynamic stuff, but physics builds and builds and builds and always uses what was before. The word inexorably comes to mind. So the physics that you've learned before is needed to do the physics you do later. So in that sense, the questions may have elements in them that require your knowledge of thermodynamics and your knowledge of mechanics the F equals DPDT kind of stuff. Okay, let's do some more physics and society. <coughs> Just showing you how to use this form of reasoning to help guide your understanding. So this is the sort of process to look at things. Let's look at at transportation. And what I'd like to do is get a picture in mind. So let's see, press here to begin. <clears throat> to get a picture in mind on transportation, I want to think about the energy source. The energy source for driving Cars, trucks, buses, trains, airplanes, the energy source that you use for that. We're going to go to screen down. And there must be uh, videos coming on. Okay. What's this word here you see as it's coming down? Okay, Panasonic. What does sonic mean? Sonic. Uh, Sounds, right? And what is pan? The world. the world, everything. Sound for the world. Panasonic. Okay, now, let's take a look at what I've got on the screen here to start with. Oh, wow. A modern vehicle. And this particular one is a, a Tesla in the picture. The Tesla is an all-electric car. All-electric, right? What does it mean, all-electric? No gas. No gas is what you guys want to say. Within 20 minutes, you will never say that again in your life. Okay? This is an electric car. There is no gasoline on the vehicle. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let's look at... An intermediate car, going back in history a little bit. What do you see there? A 1930 Ford Model A. They made five million of these cars. That car looks exactly like the one I drive every day, except that's the fancy model. I got the poor man's model. Okay. What is that used to go down the road? Now say it again. <laughs> Within 20 minutes you will still say gasoline for that car, okay? <laughs> All right. Now, let's look a little earlier in the technology. What's that? It looks like a carriage, doesn't it? That's a Baker Electric car. Around 1900, 1902. Around 1900, the most common car in the United States was an electric car. Baker Electric, Detroit, all kinds of car manufacturers made battery-powered cars. 
So electric cars are old technology. This is about as old school as you can get and still be in a car. They even look like horse carriages there, don't they? Okay, that's a horseless carriage. How fast did it go? How fast does that guy go? Uh, I've never driven one. I'm going to guess about 10 miles an hour. Okay, my Model A will scare the living daylights out of you at 45. Okay, and uh, uh, Model T's went about 25 miles an hour, I think. Maybe 35 when you really got screwed up your courage. Um, okay. So, the question that ought to be coming to your mind initially is, well, let's see, we had all electric cars more than 100 years ago. Why did we quit using them? And why are they coming back now? The answer why they're coming back now is a little complicated, but it's worth trying to figure out a little better. The answer of why we left them behind is real clear. They don't work very well. They get around in town. They can drive short distances, but batteries do not store very much energy per cubic meter, per cubic centimeter. Batteries are a relatively poor energy storage uh, device compared to gasoline. Gasoline stores roughly on the order of 10 times as much energy per volume than typical batteries do. And batteries are getting better and better and pushing a little closer and a little closer. But the miracle of gasoline is 35 megajoules per liter is stored and is available. 35 megajoules per liter. So what happened was, as long as people drove only around town, short distances, electric cars worked really great. There were no highways then that had any pavement on them. They were just horse tracks and things going across from city to city. So at that time, or train tracks. And as a result, the transportation for cars was just around town. Then the Model T and the Model A came along in the United States and other vehicles elsewhere in the world and made longer distance transportation possible because the energy you could store on the vehicle could take you more than a few miles. And so you could drive from town to town using gasoline. And as a result, electricity has never been able to do more than short distances. Even today, the best electric transportation you can get can only do a couple hundred miles at most. So you don't get long distance trips. You can't do long distance travel. The electric car can be used for very short trips and does work just fine if you're going only around town for your short trips. If you can only afford one vehicle and you need a vehicle to do short trips and long trips, it must be a gasoline or diesel. It must be a petroleum powered car. So if you want to have an about town car that's electric, you must have enough money to be able to have another vehicle to handle that or another access to a vehicle which can handle the long distance. Yes? The hybrid car is in between these two. So the hybrid cars uh, have some sensibility in them in that they can regenerate some of the energy from, that's lost in braking time and put it into storage, battery, or some form like that, and then have an electric boost or electric assist and help with that. So they have a benefit of sort of reharvesting the potentially lost energy. The downside of the hybrids is you now must have two power systems in the car, and it costs you the energy to produce two power systems and the energy to carry two power systems. So what I want to do now is do a comparison I want to compare all electric, like the Baker Electric here, or the Tesla I just showed, versus a car like the Model A, uh, and compare the actual hydrocarbon consumption of both types of vehicles, the actual full hydrocarbon consumption. Let's see if we can figure that out. OK, so we're looking at that guy versus that guy versus that guy. Okay, the full technology range that we've seen over the last more than 100 years. (laughs) 
Okay. <clears throat> How much power do you need to drive? And let's drive a car. Okay. If you're sitting still in the car and it's parked, it doesn't take any energy. Now, let's imagine the car is going down the road. Take your hand, take a hand, and move it. Do you feel anything? The force is with you, right? Now move it very quickly. What do you notice increases on the the air resistance, you feel it maybe if you've got a little hair on the back of your hand, you feel the air resistance. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of car you have in a sense. If you're going to go from point A to point B, you must push the air out of the way that's in front of the car. So there is air friction for all vehicles, and <clears throat> unless you work in a vacuum, okay? So, air friction, the friction force. The air friction force goes something like something like that. What are these terms that I've just put here? The air friction force depends on the speed. The area is the frontal area, the silhouette of the car. The CV, this is the, sometimes they put a CD, sometimes a CD, so some kind of drag coefficient. And rho is the density of the fluid that you are pushing out of the way. Imagine pushing air out of the way. And imagine pushing water out of the way. Which one is easier? Air. Air, by a long shot, right? Okay, so this is our famous old density. That's the density of the fluid. The fluid density, okay. And a half is a half. Okay, so let's see now. How did I come up with this model? Well, frankly, personally, by measuring it. I had a time when I went to uh, Los Alamos for a little, pick up a little bit of equipment, and I drove my van, and I put it on, what is that, autopilot, right? And listened to, uh, probably as Don Giovanni, right? It's a beautiful long opera. It's really neat. And then drove very steady speed for a long period of time and put gasoline in the car. Drove steady speed, a different speed for a long period of time and mapped the energy consumption on these flat straight roads and found that as you increase the speed of the car, the coefficient of this uh, friction force, incre the friction force increases and it's not just linear with speed. It goes about as the square when you're up there around 60 miles an hour. Do you mean like you put on cruise control? Yeah, cruise control. Yeah, that's, my, that's the word. Okay. 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 Autopilot, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> so turn on the cruise control and measure it, okay? Now, I'm not the only person who's done that. A lot of people have done it. So, so if you have relatively slow speeds of things, you might model that, oh yeah, there's no air friction when it's standing still, and the air friction increases as you go going faster. You could readily make a drag model that's proportional to V. Not V squared, but proportional to V. And that one will work fine over some range of speeds. And the V squared one works fine over some range of speeds. It depends on the types of fluids and the, the, the viscosity of the things that are involved, I suppose, and all these manner of details. I'm using this model because I have found that it applies at highway speeds for automobiles. So that's why I picked this one, okay? Can you measure the drag coefficient of something? Sure. Here's a piece of paper. Doesn't this look like it's about the size of an exam sheet of paper? 
And what is the mass of a single sheet of paper on an exam? How many dollar bills can you lay across it to fill up the area? Four or five grams, do I hear six? Would you put $10 bills on this for me, sir? <laughs> okay, so what we, can we know the mass, right? Okay, and if we, so now let's look at this. So we know the force, don't we? If it goes to steady state, steady speed in dropping, and we know the mass was say 10 grams, five grams, whatever, M times G, that's the force. If it's steady speed, then we know that the upward drag force equals the mg force, and you know what the drag force is then. If I drop this thing, does it reach a steady falling speed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how long did it have to fall before it reached that? Long. Not long, right? Maybe this distance, okay? And this piece has some plastic on it, it's a little heavier. Your exam sheet would fall a little slower, wouldn't it? <laughs> so you can calculate by your own measurements what the drag force looks like. What's the speed of this thing? You can measure it, right? It's not a hard thing to do. So you have the ability to measure drag coefficients all on your own. You do not have to trust this number that I've put up here, but I'm going to use it now. Okay, so at 60, at 60 miles per hour, a commonly attained speed in, in vehicles, right? At 60 miles an hour, F drag of a car is about one half. What's rho for air? 1.29, right? 1.29 uh, CV. Let's put in a 0.4. Kind of not a great car, 0.4. V squared. Oh, what is V? 60 miles an hour, 25 meters a second approximately. And anything else? The area. Okay. The area of a car. Let's see, the cars tend to have two people that, that sit next to each other. So I got one person sitting here. And then the other person is sitting over here. This is my wife, and she's going, oh my God, he's driving. <laughs> okay, and so, so the, how wide is a car? About two meters. How tall is a car? Uh, one and a half meters, say. One meter, somewhere around that range. Okay, so the area is about, say, two meters. And it depends on the, on the size of the car, doesn't it? But you're pushing out of the way somewhere two to three square meters, okay? So that force, that drag force, let's see, 625, what do we got here? 625, oh, times 1.29 is what? 750, we'll go with that. 375, back to 750, times 0.4, what do we got? Huh, what's that? 100. I'm hearing 155, do I hear 300? Do I hear 400? Oh, okay, so let's go with the 300, who cares? Okay, so, so uh, three times 10 squared, Okay, and the, let's see, what do we got? Let me, let me just make sure I'm happy with that. Uh, 620. Okay, I'm good enough to go with that. So that's about 320, okay? <clears throat> now, what are the units for that? Newtons, right? So we're talking Newtons. Okay, and so there's a, this is the air drag force. Now. Power is force per time, right? It's force times distance per time. It's DEDT, if you want to put it in that kind of sense to remind yourself, right? Okay, so at, at 60, at 60 miles per hour, then the power needed is force times 
speed, right? F dot V. So it's equal to 3 times 10 squared times 2.5 10 to the 1 meters per second. That's about 7.5 times 10 cubed. Now what is the number there? What are the units of power? Watts. Joules per second, watts, right? Watts. Okay? Now, let's put this in terms. Do you guys go out and look at your cars and go, what is the uh, kilowatt rating for your car? You probably don't. So let's remember, uh, or let's get 746 watts per horsepower. So this is equal to 10 horsepower. So as a rule of thumb, we need to provide work on the ground of 10 horsepower to go 60 miles an hour. This is independent of the type of power source, right? Independent of power, power source independent or power type independent. Is there an inefficiency in the engine? Does it heat things up? Is it a thermodynamic thing and we have to worry about that efficiency factor? Yes. The engine supply, <coughs> the energy supplied takes about three times to put uh, three times equal to 30 horsepower, right, to put the, put the power on the ground. Right, the inefficiency and engine efficiency. Okay, let's make a, 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 a <coughs> let's suppose then a typical car needs uh, then uh, what is three? times 7.5 times 10 cubed is about 22 kilowatts. Kilowatt in energy consumption, power consumed. How much energy Hydrocarbons Hydrocarbon sourced is consumed in an hour. Okay. Energy is power times time. The power we're consuming is about 2.2 times 10 to the fourth watts per second, or joules per second, excuse me, times one hour. How many seconds in an hour? Oh, 60 minutes. That's that old knuckle based uh, 60 base 12 stuff again, times 60 seconds. 3.6 times 10 cubed seconds. 
So we see it's about 8 times 10 to the 7th joules per hour. Somewhere around there, right? And let's see, in an hour, how far did we go? At 60 miles per hour, then 60 miles in one hour. Now gasoline, gasoline. Has about, uh, let's see, we got some, dim, 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 ten other things. Gasoline has about 35 megajoules per liter. So what we're needing is on the order of a gallon per hour, maybe two gallons an hour depending on your car, right? So it's needing, uh, do, 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 do. this would be three, yeah, about one gallon, two, two gallons. per hour are needed. So you're going to get somewhere around 30 to 60 miles a gallon in that range. The best one can do is about Somewhere in this range of 30 to 60 miles per gallon. Maybe you can get 60. You cannot get 120. This is a limitation. As long as you want to push air out of the way, you will not get better than somewhere around 60 miles per gallon of hydrocarbon consumption. Remember, this is independent of what the power is that's on the car. You have to provide that energy from somewhere. You can have the gasoline burning on the car, or you can have the hydrocarbon burning at the power station that produced the electricity that you charged it with. You use the hydrocarbon at either location or both. You did not get rid of using hydrocarbons. By using an electric car, you use hydrocarbons. You've got to use them to get down the road to push the air out of the way. OK, so my point is, when you look at a vehicle, here's the vehicle. Does it use gasoline or hydrocarbons? Let's expand it slightly, so include coal, because that's actually really got to be considered. The vehicle uses hydrocarbons, whether you see it at the car or not, OK? Around the corner where the electric power is produced, the hydrocarbons are getting consumed. So the all-electric car merely shifted the hydrocarbon consumption away from where the consumer saw it directly at the point of usage, did not remove it. Okay? So in that sense, the electric car and the gasoline car are equivalent in terms of how, quote, green they are whatever that greenness means, okay? Now, these are complicated questions to ask. So if the green thing comes up as a question, you can say, okay, if I have the power plant providing the electricity, maybe I've got a little more control over where the CO2 goes, as opposed to where the carbon dioxide goes from all the vehicles. Yeah, you have a little different control, but you're producing the same amount of CO2 for every 
watt you need at the car, one location or another. You could say, oh, the efficiency of the electric plant is a little better. They can run those things with a little higher efficiency and improve that factor of three business. Yes, but there's also a power transmission line now, and it has losses. And we're not done considering the energy consumption of a car just because we drove it down the road. So let's suppose you drive a vehicle. So driving 10,000 miles per year. How many gallons of gas does that take? Suppose, what kind of gas mileage would you like to say your car gets? Right today, not the best we can do, but a typical car today. 20, eh, 20. let's use 25. We'll be more optimistic, right? And by, I, by the way, I get 25 with my Model A. Um, so, let's see now. Let's suppose 25. Suppose 25 miles per gallon. Then, how many gallons per year is that? 400 gallons per year. Good. Okay, 400 gallons per year. And then let's suppose times how long between when the vehicle is produced and when it is junkyarded, destroyed, recycled, whatever happens. 10 years, nice number to work with for this, right? And it's about right. So let's say times 10 years. So that's 4,000 gallons that are consumed of hydrocarbons by the electric car or by the gasoline car. Okay, 4,000. And that's, and then when you make carbon dioxide, you got to add the O2 on the mass, right? So every gallon, gallon of gasoline weighs about six pounds. Every gallon of gasoline you use, you're throwing six pounds of trash out the window. Where does it go? It goes in the air and you can't see it. So since you can't see it, it must not be trash. You're littering six pounds for every gallon that, that you got a hold of there, right? Okay, so, and by the way, I love to use gasoline, so I'm not, this is not a political thing saying gasoline is evil. Oh no, I get up in the morning and I love the smell of burning petroleum products. Okay. Ah, yes. Okay, so. Now. That car, the electric one or the gasoline one, used about six, let's see, 4,000 gallons. Now, car life cycle. Includes production, use, and destruction, right? All right, production, use, and destruction. I put that sense there because we've learned the second law of thermodynamics, the disorder must increase towards the end, right? Okay, so the destruction takes energy to do that. And let's see now, here was our 4,000 gallons, right? This portion of the vehicle's full life cycle is about typically 60% of the energy used for the vehicle over its life cycle. And the destruction, the destruction is about 20%, and the production is about 20%. 
which means if we had 4,000 gallons there for the use of the vehicle, how much energy do we need to produce it and destroy it? In addition, we need another two-thirds of that. So we need another 2,600. So we need 1,300 gallons here and 1,300 gallons here. So that the total of the car is about, right, the sum, the total, E total, is about 6,600 gallons. But wait, there's more. For just the price of shipping, I'll th throw in a second energy source. Oh wait, just the price of shipping, I'll throw in a second energy source. What kind of car has two energy sources? Prius. The Prius, for example, right? Now you had to have a higher production energy usage. And probably, although we don't know really well yet, probably a higher energy destruction usage. I can say this, a lot of the very modern hybrid cars use a lot of aluminum in their construction. Aluminum is very energy intensive. It takes about 50% more electricity to make and more power to make those kind of sophisticated products than the old steel stuff. Next, the batteries. The batteries. The all electric cars got lots of those batteries. Those batteries are very energy intensive to produce. So what you're looking at on a modern hybrid, or even worse, a complete full electric car, is the production side is maybe double that energy. Maybe as much as twice as much at present. And so the energy consumption to produce the all electric car now exceeds the energy to produce a nice little gasoline putt-putt. It actually uses more, the same or more, hydrocarbons over its life cycle than the gasoline only car. An all electric car is not gas free. It's not hydrocarbon consumption free. It uses more or the same as a typical good efficient gas car. You can't get around that middle part. You're going to use hydrocarbons to go down the road. Hydroelectricity at a major power source is limited. It is what, 11, 9 to 11 percent of the country's electricity and cannot be increased. Every river that could make hydroelectricity is tapped. We've done it. Nuclear, my favorite power source. Nuclear energy could be about doubled in world usage compared to where it's at now, but not much more than that. We just don't have enough fuel but it could be approximately doubled. Right now, it appears to be on an unfashionable list, right? <laughs> so it doesn't appear to be getting too much popular support. And the rest of the power is provided by hydrocarbon consumption. And don't even get me going on solar, okay? <laughs> we need to be serious, people. Don't get me going on solar. Okay, are we gonna be saved by ethanol? Let's do some alcohol, shall we? The only way we're going to be saved by alcohol is getting drunk and thinking it's great. <laughs> you aren't going to be saved by ethanol on this. Ethanol gets about two-thirds the energy density of gasoline. It costs as much as gasoline to make. And if you put the entire farmable acreage in the United States to ethanol production, it would not produce enough ethanol to drive the cars on the road today. Don't even think it. Does ethanol have some advantage for some of the little pollutant things? Yes. So the issue here is all this green stuff is very complicated. It's very complicated. The pollution issues are serious and they need to be addressed. Maybe you want to put in a little ethanol to help with the pollution, but you can't put in 100% because it's not going to work for us. Why would a manufacturer be willing to double their energy consumption in the production side. What is going to drive them to do that? More money. See? More money. More money. Yes, people are money motivated. What's another issue? Government, uh, issues with, uh, Government issues. 
What does the government have to do with this stuff? Subsidies, oh yes. Yes, what does a subsidy mean? It means that you got less because everybody else paid for you to go down the road. Yes. <laughs> okay, all right. Now, the government regulations have things to do with corporate average fuel economy, right? Corporate average fuel economy, the miles per gallon, the stickers are on the cars, right? They are there because the government requires it. Now, the government makes a measurement standard for those cafes or whatever they're using and says, you must have a vehicle fleet that meets this standard. And that standard does not include the energy production around the corner at the power plant. It only includes putting the vehicle on to the course, driving it around and taking it off and seeing what got used in that moment. So, if a person wants to have a really high mileage vehicle around a course, plug it in around the corner. Okay, it costs more to make the plug-in stuff, yeah, but I still beat the standard there. So if you raise the standard up, people are going to put higher and higher production costs, hide the energy consumption there. The consumer says, oh, look, I have a green car. That's wonderful. The car companies go, we met the corporate average fuel economy standards, and everybody's happy. Wait a minute. It took more hydrocarbon to do that. Not a good thing, right? In the end, it's how much hydrocarbon is available. Now, let's take a little bit of a, do you have any questions about this kind of stuff? Please look at, whenever you see a problem and somebody has a social solution to it, ask yourself, what's not included in the picture? Usually there are many complicating factors that are not included in the picture. And I'll give you an example in just a second. Yes? Is it cheaper that, no, if you buy a Prius, the, co the additional cost of even the hybrid, not the all-electric Prius, the all-electric Prius is like 38 grand, right? The hybrid, you buy the hybrid, you will have to drive that car like 200,000 miles to even break even versus what you could have done with a smaller, lighter car with gasoline only. So what you're doing is putting your capital up front or with a rebate, somebody else is paying for it. That's terrific, <laughs> okay? So they actually don't pencil out economically uh, either. Uh, but people driving them feel good, right? Everybody driving them says, oh, I'm doing green, okay? I actually was in a parking lot a couple months ago. I parked my Model A next to a Tesla, and I came back out later, and there was a guy ranting there about how the Tesla was such a green car and how the Model A should never be allowed on the road because it was, it was the worst terrible car ever, right? And I looked at him and said, you have no clue what you're talking about, do you? And then I left because that was not a polite thing to say. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so, so now, let's do that comparison. Let's see about the complication. Okay, I'm very pleased and proud I'm driving my Model A and I'm saving all kinds of energy, right? Okay, so now, the, you could say that the Model A is very green because over the course of the last 80 years, there was a production cost, but no destruction, production, destruction, production, destruction, production over the next eight generations of car used, right? And it gets 20, 25 miles a gallon, so it's not really wait, bad for that, right? Which means that that car is a factor of four or five greener than an all-electric new car. Wow. I'm going to get a gold star on the refrigerator, okay? And because it's a Model A and such a claptrap old car, I don't drive it very much. It only gets a few thousand miles a year at most, instead of 10,000, 12,000, whatever, right? Yes? Um, what are your opinions on the potential of uh, cars with electric power from onboard hydrogen fuel cells? Oh, oh, I love that kind of reaction. Uh, he says, what about hydrogen cars? Oh, when Honda started making the hydrogen car, I pulled every political string I could to get to be one of their initial owners. They told me that I got on the list, but they also told me I was not the right kind of customer because I don't have any public profile. 
they picked a few Hollywood people and stuff like that. And I just, I got thrown out in the dishwater. Hydrogen in high pressure cans has pretty low energy density actually. I just happen to like that chemical reaction. It's kind of neat. So anyway, the energy cost is to produce it, right? I mean, it's like when it sparks and makes water, the only thing coming out the back is water. But you had to make the hydrogen to start with. You had to separate it from something else, like such as a hydrocarbon, <laughs> right? So you had to produce it. And the energy production side of that, I suspect, is exceeding what we've got on any of these pictures here. I doubt it's going to be a practical thing. Okay, but it takes a very high pressure can, and I love high pressure cans, and then it makes, you know, just water coming out the back end. Oh, that's, that's so neat. Okay, and I still don't have one. <laughs> I tried. Okay, and I may try again. I mean, those, they sold those for $80,000 a piece, and they've, they're basically just like a little Prius. And I was willing to pony up, but they wouldn't take my money. Okay, and a friend of mine here on campus, we got a, they got, he got, not me, he got a hydrogen station. So we, we got a local f supply. Um, okay, now, on the Model A. So on terms of the energy consumption side of the Model A, it's greener than any of the modern cars in that sense. Now, let's say, okay, he made a very simple statement, sounded wonderful. What are the complications? Why is the Model A not the solution for everybody? The distance traveled. The distance traveled. You got to put up with, well, they drove all over the country. You can make them go across the country without too much trouble. They're very simple. They have almost no moving parts. And uh, the other thing is, though, the pollution per gallon consumed is quite substantial compared to a modern car. So now we'd have to load it up with a catalytic converter and start adding more weight and then, oh wait a minute, there are no seat belts in it. The only airbag in the car is me. <laughs> <laughs> if you hit anything over 30 miles an hour, you will be killed. So it starts to add up to, that would not be a popular solution, would it? Right? So while I can be all puffed up about how green that car is, it really doesn't solve the problem. But neither does the electric car. And it's quite modern. And if you notice, you watch the Prius ads. How many of you families have Prius? I bet quite a few actually, right? Oh, you don't want to admit? One guy's willing to admit now in front of everybody else. The Prius cars are terrifically cute little cars, right? And the ads make you feel really good. But you may notice the ads do not claim that it's a green car. There's a subtle implication that it is, but they never make any clear claim that it's a green car. Toyota engineers are smart. They know this stuff. And they actually manage to hold the marketing people to the truth, I think, which is you know, a good thing sometimes. OK, any other questions on uh, driving your vehicle? Now let's, uh, let's do a slight application of this stuff then to our country and to the world, OK? So, how much gas, and I'm using this term loosely, gasoline, diesel, okay, what's the, what's the, let's use petroleum, that's a nicer, broader sense. How much petroleum is used per day? Okay, let's think about in the United States. Let's just take a look here. In the United States. Now this is true of a lot of other places, but not all other places. So let's just talk about the United States and then say, okay, people live here. And this is what we do. People live elsewhere and by and large, 
If you switched places with them, they do what you're doing here, and you do what they're doing there. So people are people, right? So in the United States, let's see, the gasoline, petroleum, petroleum per day. That would be equal to the number of people times the petroleum per person day. And this is number of people. Okay, let's look at this. That's a pretty simple equation, isn't it? How many people are in the United States? 300 million. 300 million. And if you didn't know that, how could you estimate it? Oh, let's see. LA, Orange County, San Diego, about 15 million. California is about double southern, 30 million in California. California is about 10% of the country's population, 300 million. Three times 10 to the eighth times. What's the average petroleum consumption per person per day? And then you go, reasonable number, then you go, well, little babies don't drive and your great-grandmother might not drive, okay, and maybe some people didn't go out and drive a car that day, but some people drove more. And everybody ate food, right? And where did that food come from? Trucks. Trucks, which carried it from the farms, which are far away because we have put things on top of good farmland here and can no longer grow our food here, okay? And what gives us the ability to get the really high production of food per acre? Petroleum. Petroleum. Fueling the process for making fertilizer. The yield per acre in the United States is about four times what it was 100 years ago. And that factor of four is due to hydrocarbons. If we run out of hydrocarbons, divide that yield by four. And you're going to walk a long ways to get where you can work on that field. Because there isn't one here now, right? OK, so three times 10 to the eighth. And let's say three gallons per person day. Okay, so we arrive at roughly a billion gallons per day. A billion gallons, billion. A, that's a big number. That's 10 to the ninth. And gallons, let's see, that's, let's see, 35 megajoules per liter. A gallon then is about 125 <coughs> megajoules per liter, 130 megajoules per liter times a billion. We're talking 10 to the 11th joules per day, folks. Those numbers start to excite me. Those are big numbers. All right? Now let's look at that equation. When we start to think about how to reduce uh, this stuff, there are only two terms in that equation. What are the two terms that could be reduced? People. The number of people or gallons the day. gallons per person per day. Those are the only two <laughs> choices, people. There are not other choices in that equation. Now, when you drink water, the amount of water used in the United States, number of people times the gallons used per day. There are only two terms, people. <laughs> what are your choices? Fewer people or less consumption if you want to reduce that number. There are no other choices. Yes? Well, the number of gallons per day, would that be increased if we included, uh, I guess, uh, airlines or military use? Yeah, this is the entire consumption, okay. right? So, so, yeah, airlines, military, right? Those things use quite a bit to get you from one place to another because that half row V squared, oh, now you're flying very fast, aren't you? <laughs> That's a, quite a drag coefficient. What a drag. That's why they put everybody in rows right behind each other. 
you push the air out of the way once, and then you can put another person behind, another one behind, and so on, and it gets fairly reduced, except that the weight is increased, so the wing has to be a little bigger tilt, which has air drag there. Oh, right? And now the airlines that you get into, oh my God, the window seat, I can't even sit in anymore because <laughs> the roof is coming like this, you know? I gotta go like this, I got a stiff neck by the time I get out, okay? Oh. <clears throat> So airlines actually kind of cost you on a per kilogram basis, okay? So think about how to reduce the kilograms on the plane as well. Now, let's see, what do we have? 10 to the ninth gallons per day. Oh, let's see, 300 million. How many people live in China? Well, I'll say four times that now, right? Four times that. How many people live in India? Yeah, well, that's how many have been counted. India? <laughs> in India, how many live in India? Well, I, I don't know how many live in India, but it's at least a billion, <laughs> right? It could be one and a half billion, I don't know. Let's see, we got four times in China and probably four times in India, and we didn't count anywhere else on the planet. And we are being penguin exclusionary. We're not allowing the penguins to use any petroleum. Right? So this is just people. So we've got eight times as many people living in two countries that don't come anywhere near this petroleum consumption per person. What happens then to the petroleum consumption rate worldwide when everybody else consumes the same level we do? It's got to go way up, okay? So that means that the this stuff is little, you know, it's, it's made by Hershey's. It's a brown liquid in the ground. And then you go order up Hershey's, I want another Sunday, and get some syrup out, and that's called petroleum. So there's only so much of that down there, right? And if we, do, if we increase our consumption rate by a factor of 10, what does that tell you about how long it takes to use it up? It will happen how much faster? 10 times faster. Oh, so does God. So, for your petroleum consumption, this is a serious issue. There is only a two-term equation to cope with this. Your food supply depends on it at present. You are vulnerable, my friends. <laughs> you will live interesting lives. And the water, I think, may become an issue before petroleum really gets big. So these kinds of ways of thinking help guide your thought. Remember, the problems are more complicated than the simple solution usually indicates. I feel great driving my Model A down the road. I don't feel guilty because I don't drive it very far. So the fact it makes more pollution per gallon consumed doesn't really bother me. It's a lot of fun. Okay, and it keeps me from driving long distances in other cars. So I'm okay with that. But it doesn't solve the world's problems. Okay, you will not solve it with solar cells either. Okay, so just keep that in mind. All right, now, shall we uh, put a little spark in the class? Oh, I love that car, the Chevy. They called it the Volt. I wanted to buy one of those. And I grew up with Chevy, so I'm Chevy favor. And the interior was so ugly. I couldn't do it. Okay. Um, let us begin. We are going to study electricity now. Now, after having said the electric car was not so great, <laughs> we're going to spend the next lectures going after why electricity is the greatest thing since before sliced bread. Okay. Who invented sliced bread? You actually have all seen this product. Wonder Bread. Wonder Bread invented commercial sliced bread. Yes. Yeah. And what is the symbol on the label? The, a bunch of dots, which are representative of colored balloons, which are released at the Indianapolis 500 
motor race each year, and the guy who invented Wonder Bread said, oh, wait a minute, let's use the balloons as our symbol from the race. See how petroleum leads to such happiness? <laughs> okay? All right. Anyway, electricity, I think, is better than sliced bread and is just way cool stuff. So we're going to start doing electricity. And we're going to do electricity and magnetism because, in a way, they are manifestations of the same phenomena. And we will do electromagnetism. And then you might actually start to think about electrodynamics. So I want you to think of a sort of seamless combination of electricity, magnetism, things that are stationary and static, things that are moving. Okay? And it will arrive at the end with even with electric radiation, electric radiation, magnetic radiation, we'll call it electromagnetic radiation, commonly called in some circumstances radio waves, commonly called in some circumstances light, light waves, the stuff you are seeing me with right now, yeah, commonly called microwaves. You heated up your cup of coffee maybe, okay? All kinds of communications. And these things occur naturally. There are if somebody went outside the U.S., outside the atmosphere, outside above the planet, and listened with a radio, and then they heard Howard Stern, now, they would go, no signs of intelligent life. <laughs> now they go to some of the outer planets. They go to Uranus, Neptune, and they hold, the, or Jupiter, and they hold the antenna, and they listen. They will hear radio waves. And they will go, ah, the potential for signs of intelligent life is there because Howard Stern is not. <laughs> so the antennas will pick it up in natural locations. It doesn't have to be made by people. Okay, so let's see. All right, do this one. Electricity. Elec, you think I'd be able to spell better than that? Okay, electricity. Okay, electric. What does that sound like as the root of the word? Where, what language that might that come from? Greeks, right? Greeks. Those ancient Greeks. Maybe this kind of stuff has been around since that long. Little manifestations in nature. You take a piece of pine pitch and it's hardened up with age, dried out a little bit, and then it does, it's not quite so sticky. And you can rub it on something. Now, how many of you have played a violin or a cello or a string bass until you told your parents that it wasn't something you were going to do anymore, right? Okay. Now, one of my daughters plays cello. My mother has played violin now for 75 years. Yeah, yeah. And she is that old, by the way. She's like 84. I, I stopped counting a long time ago. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the bow on these things. What do you use to make the bow stick just right? Rosin. Rosin. And that is dried pine pitch. And what you're trying to do there is make that difference between the static and sliding coefficient of friction just right kind of like angle of repose issues, to make it stick and slip on the string as it goes across. So that allows you to provide the power. If it slid without sticking, then you would not make any sound from the string. If it just sticks, then you move the string, but it doesn't vibrate. So you need it to move and vibrate. So you use the amber. You look to the natural world and find all kinds of wonders in what the natural world can provide. And that amber can provide a little bit of a spark, too. Okay? And people also take two rocks and go, oh, spark, 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 you know, to make fire. That's cool. You know what I like to use to make fire? Matches. 
petroleum. <laughs> it works great. Pour some of that lighter fluid on it, take a match, and go boom. Don't mess around with this other stuff. <laughs> so let's take a look here. Now, long ago when I started doing these kind of lectures, this is a piece of felt. It's not a cat's fur. And they don't even bring it for me anymore. They used to use a cat fur, the skin of a cat or a rabbit for this, you know, because it makes good sparks. But this is politically correct. This is green felt. Okay. Let's see here. Would somebody like to help? No, uh, have you helped, madam? Would you care to in this moment? Oh, what a thought. Let's go for it. Let's see. And you are? I'm Cassidy. Cassidy. Hi, I'm Roger McWilliams. Pleasure nice to, meet to meet you. Nice to meet you. Okay. Are we ready? <laughs> what we're going to do, that is mechanically striking, right? Now, I'm going to take this and put it here. And I want you to be in charge of this. All right. You hold this guy like that, bring it up there, bring it near, and let's just hold it to about here. Bring it out a little, like that. Now, is it doing anything? Nope. No, it's not doing anything. Nope. Bad tube. <laughs> okay, now it will do it if you hit, right? Go ahead. And it does move then, right? It does. Okay, so now what I want to do is I'm going to put some charge on the tube by using this felt. Okay, there's yours, right? And I'm gonna do something over here, the same. We're gonna put the same kind of charge on this guy. Now, bring it close. Whoa! Okay, you guys, you get ready. On count of three. You ready? You do the same thing. One, two, three. Whoa! Oh no, that was not that, I, that was not as satisfying a woe as I would like to hear. Come on, you, you just work on this end. That one doesn't have much going. So I want you to hold it exactly the way I said at the start with that overlap. Let me get it balanced. You ready? Yeah. Okay, is this thing now, is this accelerating now? Okay, we're gonna do the woe and then we're gonna get quantitative. Are we ready? We're gonna do the qualitative thing to start. Ready? Bring her in. One, two, three, whoa, action at a distance, whoa, and did you accelerate the other rod away? I did with this. He, she did. You, the power is with you. Yes. Actually, I like to think of the force is with you, right? <laughs> okay, now, ah, what is the mass? You can tell me or you can say they have to do it because you're up here and you get a free pass. You have to do it. Okay. <laughs> She's helping out and it's a little, now, you guys suggested she come up, now you're stuck. Ten grams. No, it's less. Like, it's not too heavy, is it? Total mass, not, not tipping, but five. mass, right? Five grams, five grams, ten grams. Maybe I'll take one back to the lab and get a good weight for you, okay? <laughs> All right, so you got a, an idea from, do you trust these two gentlemen? No. Do you trust that lady? No. Because you didn't make your own measurement, did you? All right, so when we get done, you might wanna come down quickly and get your own measurement, and I'm gonna go get one too. Okay, now I'm gonna put some charge back on here. Oh, what is the shape of this? Yeah, not quite. But it's a rod, yes? It's a rod. How long is it? One meter, isn't it? When it's on this pivot in the center, it's rotating about the center, isn't it? Just take a moment to think about the inertia. Moment of inertia. Oh, do you remember that? Can you find it in your textbook? Will you look for it this afternoon? Yes, you will overcome. 
Okay? You make sure they give you good notes. I will. If they don't, you send them up here for a demo and you don't give them good notes either. <laughs> okay? Now I'm going to put this here to pivot and Cassidy, is that right? Yes. You use this end. Now, we want to get quantitative. Hold it 20 centimeters away and keep it 20 centimeters away. Now, you got to keep it, I want the thing, the geometry at 20 centimeters, so. All right, keep going, just walk. Okay, yeah, as far as, and then you got to stop there, right? Oh, you're better, you're better. Okay, what do we see? You saw the acceleration, and then she's kind of, it's kind of steady at this point, isn't it? Okay, now, bring it around where you're on the back side, Cassidy, and then come to a halt. Move away. Okay, now, hold it at 10 centimeters separation. We cut the separation a factor of two now, right? Okay, go for it, go for it. And what do you notice about the acceleration? What do you notice about the speed overall? And, oh, doesn't it kind of look like constant acceleration until she, oh, she's getting going quicker and quicker now, isn't she? Okay, now stop, stop, okay, stop. Okay, now we did 20 and we did 10. What do you think we're going to do next? Look at that, it's something, remember, science is predictable. <laughs> no, that's about seven and a half. Yeah, yeah, get going. Oh, you just. And it's even quicker, right? Okay. Now, okay. Now, let's do this guy. And this guy. Okay. Try to do it at one centimeter. Try to measure the acceleration here, folks. How would you do that? And you're going to have to really hustle. I know, right? right? No, no, from the side, from the side, not from the top. That didn't count. You come back around, start over. You, the technique will get improved as you practice and repeat, right? You do, you, yeah, no, it takes repetition to get a good, steady measurement done. Well, that's about five centimeters. Okay, fine enough, fine enough. <laughs> five centimeters, constant acceleration. The separation was about five centimeters. The acceleration was constant. You better sit down and get some notes. I think that's a good thing to do. Thank you, excellent, excellent. She is the pivot master for the morning, right? Because we've got the pivoting going there. So now, the rod at five centimeters caused an angular acceleration to equal 180 degrees in what kind of time? How long did it take? Uh, around two seconds to go 180 degrees. If you said it was constant angular acceleration, you should be able to calculate what the acceleration is. You know what the mass of this is, or you will by your own measurements. You can calculate the moment of inertia. If you know what the acceleration is, you should be able to figure the torque. Hence, you should know the force that she applied as well. Look at all that stuff that you can know just from putting a rod on a pivot and stroking the plastic piece with a piece of felt. Isn't that depressing? <laughs> Doesn't that sound like exam questions? Now, and you're going, why is he doing this? Why on earth will I ever need to know about rotating a plastic rod with another plastic rod? When will that arise in your life? Do you think it will ever occur again? Maybe. Maybe. The next place that that maybe may happen is when you get a little static electricity in your hair. Okay, let's show your hair. There's the long stuff, right? And if we got two pieces of hair with some electric charge on them, oh, you have that too. I do. Yes, <laughs> then they repel each other. We observed that the similar charges repelled. That's our first observation. We also observed that the force was weaker with distance. And you, in fact, it wasn't proportional to distance. When you got down to two centimeters, like, I can't keep up I with it, right? 
So I want to propose that the force goes as a 1 over r squared. Not 1 over r, but 1 over r squared. That it gets strong very quickly as you get in close. Yes. So when you get your hair with some charge on it, the two hairs are sitting next to each other and repel. And so what is that called? You have what kind of hair? Frizzies. Is that right? Now, in your case, the forces aren't going to move it very far, right? But when there's a long lever arm, the longer hair, there's more opportunity for more charge, and the torque can be substantial, right? So it varies. Depends on the length of the hair, how much you will feel that, OK? So <clears throat> we now have seen that like charges repel, that the force is calculable. You measured the angular acceleration there. And uh, that the force looks like it probably goes as 1 over r squared in roughly that range. Let's do another way of looking. Oh, here's a pet can. Another volunteer. Uh, <laughs> have you helped before? Yeah. No. Before. We'll get him by surprise later. <laughs> have, you, have you helped? No. Come on up. What is this thing? Uh, Starbucks. Uh, Starbucks double shot. <laughs> get your energy here. Higher energy density. <laughs> That's a bunch of bull. <laughs> okay, and you are? Jeremy. Jeremy, hi Jeremy. Come on over here. Okay, um, let's put your pet can down in the middle uh, and let's have it be like that. Okay, and here is a charged rod. Why don't you come over here where I am? Bring that rod like this towards that can. Now, go back. Go back. No, okay. Now, go back. Oh. Now what happened? It's attracted now, right? So your pet can, I don't want to, okay. Oh, you can't get rid of it now, can you? It's very attached to him. So now we found that there was a way to make electric forces that are attractive. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Do you want, no, they probably want to keep that, so I'd give it to you otherwise. Okay, now let's take a look here. Uh, have you helped? Yes. Uh, would you lie to me? <laughs> have you helped, madam? Uh, sir, have you helped? Yeah, you guys are all playing that game. Have you helped, madam? Would you like to now? Would you? Sure. Okay, come on down. I want everybody to participate. Have you helped, sir? Next time, right? Yeah, next time you'll come down. So I want everybody to because, hi. Hi, I'm hi. Shreya. Shreya, I'm Roger McWilliams, hi. So when you do it, Cassidy, yes. you will remember that the rest of your life. Yes. Absolutely. It's the best time of my life. Yeah, well, I don't know about that part, but you, will, you remember physics by doing it, by making the measurements, doing the examples yourself. Shreya, yes. what do you see here? This is a little hard for people to see, so I'm gonna, you, why don't you describe it from the front so that we know what people are seeing? Hmm. Hmm, that's a good start. <laughs> I would use exactly that word as my beginning description. So. Okay, it Th looks that like help? a little um, circular yes. metal. Um, metal, yes. Uh, Good. Uh, honey, you're batting a thousand so far. You're doing great. <laughs> like a tray type thing, but the back is. Um, so inside the glass, glass, inside the glass or plastic, mm -hmm. there's a needle, yeah. and it's on a pivot. And then there's a straight wire. Can you guys see that at all? Can you see it in the back? It's a disaster for visuals. 
then we'll just fake it and just pretend and they don't even know, huh? No, we would never do that. The truth is what we observe, right? No, let's do this. Here, you can take Cassidy's uh, rod there. Now, touch it to the top. And what happened to the needle? Oh, it spins. The needle went, the needle is now almost at 90 degrees with that vertical wire at the, at the, there. So the charge, this is like the getting charge on two hairs. There's charge along the vertical wire and there's charge on the needle and they repel each other to the point of making almost a 90 degree repulsion because that would be the lowest energy position to be. Let's try charging by touching this string. Just touch the string with the rod. Did it do anything? No. No, so strings do not conduct electricity. Now, charge it by touching this wire. Oh, it worked. Metals conduct electricity. This one looks like what kind of metal? It looks like copper. It looks like copper. It is copper. Okay, that's terrific. Thank okay. you very much. No problem. Okay. And you will be next time, okay? We'll have something exciting for you as the next demo to start. Okay, let me check on the time, but I think we are just about at that moment. Indeed. A happy day to you this morning, and we'll look forward to more exciting examples tomorrow. <laughs>